You're listening to Gender, A Wider Lens. I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Since 2016, my practice has been exclusively dedicated to gender questioning teens and families impacted by gender dysphoria. I also work with gender questioning teenagers and I facilitate at support meetings for families and individuals who have been impacted by gender issues. We're curious about the concept of gender and how it's unfolding in the wider culture. Join us as we look at gender through a wider lens. Hi, Sasha. Hi, Stella. How's it going today? Very good. Um, we're, we're, we're going off piste today with our translations episode. And the concept behind this is because so many parents have said to us, could you do one where we could we could listen to the, the with our child, we could listen together and maybe we could provide understanding both from where the kid is coming from, the gender dysphoric kid, where they're coming from and give some insight into that. And at the same time, give some insight into where the parent is coming from, because nobody's more important than anybody else in this world. And yeah. so that's the grand plan for today's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I've noticed working with a lot of families that sometimes they almost need a translator because they're like, well, you know, when my kid says this, I'm trying to understand, but I don't I don't know what they mean by that or I don't understand how they think that way. And, um, you know, our goal today is for us to to provide some opportunities to have empathy for one another, you know, parents to have greater empathy for the difficulty their child's going through and for teenagers or young adults who might be listening to this to try and develop a perspective of, you know, why do you, why do your parents come from that perspective or why are your parents raising the concerns they're raising? So hopefully we can get into this. And what we're, we're going to do is um, kind of divide up our conversation into three different scenarios. So the first scenario that we're going to talk about is uh, imagine that a young person has been really struggling in their life. Now it might be socially regarding a friend group, they might have had some challenges academically, and they've been really having a hard time with their mental health. And then they discover online forums that talk about gender identity. And perhaps the young person's been researching gender identity for some time and kind of trying on different identities to see what feels right. And maybe the parent has either recently discovered that their child is questioning their identity, or maybe the, the kid has come out to their parents. And then, um, you know, there's a, a, a challenge in communication around that point. So that's kind of scenario one. So Stella, what do you see as a, a parent's response here that we might want to explain or translate? The parents, I believe, to, to, to provide some translation here, the parents generally think, I know what I'm on about here. This is a new feeling with the child and I can just talk all over this kid because I'm older, I have experience, they don't understand things and I'm going to tell them what's what. Now, generally, that's coming from a place of fear. And sometimes when we're very frightened, we come out as very authoritative, almost authoritarian. Mm -hmm. When I'm most frightened with my children, I'm like, no, this is it. And I become like, you know, this kind of fascist, really. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> I'm so frightened of where they're going that I need to close it down as an option. It's almost like my child is running out into the road and I'm pulling them back. And so the, the parent is in operating from fear and speed. And they can really say almost really, really distressing things at that point because they're frightened. And when you're frightened, your mouth opens and you can say crazy things. <laughs> and it, 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 it's I think it's maybe arguably not quite fair to take that down and use it as evidence against the parent for the rest of their life, because it might have come from a place of sheer terror that the child might be doing something dangerous and it mightn't help them. Mm. Well, from the young person's perspective, I imagine what they are feeling is that, you know, maybe learning about gender provided the first time in a long while that they felt hopeful that there's a solution for their problems. You know, they might have really related to some of the things they learned about what it means to have gender dysphoria or to be trans. And they've thought, gosh, you know, finally, after years of having a hard time, there's maybe something here that could help me. And I come to my parents who I know they love me, they've been there for me in the past, 
and they shut that down. And that feels really confusing. And I, I thought they just wanted me to be happy. And here I am with an idea that I feel pretty certain is going to help me. And they've said no. And I feel really confused and heartbroken. And often the parent is thinking, you think you've got the solution. You're the child. Well, I know better because I'm 30 years older than you. And they, they think it because it's the thing is between the years 10 and 20, the, it, we're renegotiating. And so you've gone from the, the child will follow everything I do. I'll tell them what to mm. eat. I'll tell them when to eat. I'll tell them what to wear. I'll tell them everything. And then between those 10 to 20, the child is saying, well, actually, you won't. Actually, I have me. And the parent is like, no, no, no. On this one, I'm still in control. And they, they honestly think, the parent honestly thinks, I understand this subject. I mightn't understand all the acronyms and all this, but I do know the transition is, is a huge decision and I do know that it shouldn't be taken lightly and I do know that the child has had other diagnosis and so I need to kind of make sure that I keep my child safe and because I'm frightened I can be harsh and I can be very harsh and bossy and try to push the child back into being a toddler. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. it's just out of instinct. It's just out of mm-hmm. instinct that the parent mm-hmm. is like, this is the most frightening thing you've ever said to me. And I'll say anything right now to push that back into the box, to just push it back into the box. And it's not lack yeah. of love. It's fear. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that's really true. I mean, that let's just make this all go away or let's reverse course on this is a feeling that I think is very prominent here. And something else I'll say from maybe the young person's perspective, sometimes the young person isn't really interested in pursuing anything medical. Maybe they're just kind of exploring what does this identity mean? I just want to try different pronouns or I just want a haircut. And the parent has come on quite strong and said, you know, did you know the dangers of these medical procedures or kind of talking about the long term outcomes for some people who do make medical choices. And sometimes the young person's like, mom, what are you talking about? That's not even where I'm at. You know, I'm just talking about pronouns and you're talking about, you know, surgery. I'm not there. And so again, I think that makes communication difficult because the parent is guessing what's in their child's mind. And the child feels like when I say something, it's getting blown out of proportion So I don't really feel motivated to tell mom and dad everything anymore. And so everyone's kind of playing this guessing game of where where this is leading. And it's 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 fascinating, really, because although the the parent can fall into this being very authoritarian, only out of fear, often they don't actually they've often got their sense of of trans identity is something shaped from maybe a few years ago. And they're not realizing that maybe this is just a gender identity thing that's happening to the child, that it mightn't be medical transition. They just hear trans equals medical. That's what the parent is thinking. And they're not hearing the child talking about names and pronouns because they're just thinking medical, medical. Oh, my God, what's going to happen to their body? They're off on surgery. And that's the type of thing they're they're kind of researching. So the child goes off and thinks, oh, my God, th- that didn't go well. While the parent is thinking, oh, my God, and who, who will they use? And what's their health insurance? And what will happen? And they're mm. off on questions that the child hasn't gone anywhere near. But the, the parent is literally from their place of knowledge. And the parent's place of knowledge equals transition is medicalization. And it's scary. And it carries a heavy medical burden on the body. And it has implications. And my child doesn't realize this. The child is in a different very, is having, it's like one is speaking Spanish and the other is speaking French mm-hmm. at this stage. Because there's, mm-hmm. 
two very different things are going on. But it's a, there's an interesting parallel. I always have this image of like the mother's in the bed on her laptop scrolling and reading all about medicalization and surgeries and and all these huge kind of really difficult kind of medical kind of implications of estrogen and testosterone. The child is in the, just there's only a wall between them. There's maybe only six foot between the two of them. The child is in her room on her laptop and she's talking about philo- philosophical kind of scenarios, what it is to be an identity. They're in, they're in two different worlds. They would never actually meet online because they're in two different worlds yeah. where they're going. That's, that's yeah. my, my feeling of what's happening. I want to ask kind of a different question. What about parents and families who their, their young ch- uh, child or teenager has come out and at the beginning, the parents were like, okay, that's fine. We can use different pronouns or sure, you can experiment with a different identity. And then maybe the family starts... Uh, kind of changing its tune and maybe parents start pulling back on the rules they set before or maybe they start to show hesitation when at first it seemed like the parents were on board. Um, I'm imagining from the young person's perspective, there can probably be a couple things going on and I'll go out on a limb here. I think on one hand, the young person might feel, you know, this is unfair. You told me that this was okay And you gave me this like taste of independence of being able to choose my own pronouns and my name and that kind of thing. And now you're changing the story on me. It feels a little bit uh, kind of disingenuous or something. On the other hand, I wonder for some young people, if is there some relief in saying, well, my mom won't let me do that. So I kind of have to back off. I think sometimes if a young person has a lot of friends who's, who are questioning their gender and everyone's got different pronouns, it can almost be like choice fatigue, you know, like when you have so many choices of who to be or how to identify. I mean, it can feel kind of great, but it can also feel overwhelming. So I wonder if a young person has a mix of like annoyed, annoyed feelings that mom and dad kind of change their minds, but then maybe also like, well, I guess I'll just have to kind of slow down and I I can blame my parents if I don't get to do the same things that my friends are doing. And that's kind of a relief too. I wonder Mm. if there's a mix of those. I think, yeah, I think you've got it. I think you've got real insight in what you said in what's going on in the teenage brain at that point, I think. I'm sure we'll hear from listeners if we got it wrong, but I think you got it there. You nailed it. I do think there's, you know, there's one parent who I described who just goes straight to medicalization and that's where they're going. But once they hear trans, they've gone into medical. And there's another one who thinks, okay, okay, off you go. This is just your identity. Off you go. This is your phase. And they uh, allow it to to unfold. And then they realize the child isn't getting happier. And the decisions aren't making the child happy. And actually, there's a fixation. It feels like a fixation on their gender that probably isn't helping them. And that's when the parents start actually active, actively kind of engaging and going, oh, uh, maybe I wasn't right to let you na- change your name. Maybe maybe it hasn't helped you. And that can be very unsettling and very distressing for everybody. But when I have to say as a parent, and I am one, when you feel you've got it wrong, it's 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 so destabilizing. You feel like the ground from, has fallen from under you. You know what I mean? And so you can be a little bit all over the place at that point. Just to have compassion for the parent, they think, I made a decision and I don't think it has helped you. And that can be anything, you know what I mean? That can be for, you know, some parents whose kids went on medication for ADHD or for depression. And then they think, actually, that hasn't helped. That is Mm -hmm, solidified mm -hmm. and it's gone a direction that or they brought them to a therapist that they don't think it's helped. So you can almost bear anything but the, the pain of having hurt your child. Can you say more about why? Why is that so painful for parents? I think it's our job. It's our job. We feel like, you know, when the little baby came into our arms and they were just so defenseless and they looked up at us as in, you're going to keep me safe. And you kind of look at them thinking, I'm going to keep you safe. And that's my job and I'm going to do it. And it's it's so profound and it's so, I remember the sense of terror I felt 
when I first had a baby. And it was like, it was so, it was so, it was so frightening, but so intense and big. And I, this little baby was like, you, you, you're my world and you're going to keep me safe. And I was going to do it. And, you know, it's honestly, it's not that bad, even though I was appalling at it, but it's not that hard. <laughs> Those first few years, you know, it's not that hard. All you have to do is feed them, put them in a pot, pot you know, in a cot and <laughs> change their nappy. But you don't put them in a pot, right? That's not, <laughs> that's not what we do. Gosh, <laughs> I meant to say. Um, and, you know, you change the nappy and it's, you know, you do the things and you keep them safe. And yeah. then somewhere along the way, you know, you hear like, I, you know, I, I heard my kid talk about how one boy basically treated her badly and, you know, effectively dismissed her in front of the friends. And, you know, he just did this harsh thing. You want to go and murder him? <laughs> I wanted to go and murder him. It's like, oh, my God, he did that to you. And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, I, need, I need I need to do something. I can't just sit around while this boy is treating you like this. And she's like, I've got it. I've got it. It's OK. And it's like. Pain has been given to them and I, I can't stop it. It's, I, I can't stop it. It's a very, very hard thing to watch your child in distress and not be able to alleviate it. It's a whole other level when you mm -hmm. feel I've done it. And so, for example, if you've picked the wrong school for the kid or if you've done something and I have gone to awful, awful places where I think I did wrong by my kids. And I just think, oh, man. And I think we parents can almost not face it. So we tell ourselves we did the right thing. We did the right thing because the idea that we might have hurt them. But if you're a child and if your parent is rowing back, it's because they're in the most dreadful place of, I think I didn't do right by you. It's not nothing else. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Sometimes, I think oftentimes, when a young person is starting to explore a different identity, it's usually because something about their birth sex identity isn't really working well. So by definition, that means the parents know their kid is already struggling, and that puts everybody on edge. You know, parents want their kids to be happy for the most part. So yes, I, I can understand that. And I also want to say, you know, you mentioned a, a quick phrase that I picked up on. If a parent thinks that a kid is going through a phase, I want to touch on that because coming from the young person's perspective, there's nothing more insulting than being told that you're going through a phase. And, you know, it's kind of like one of these interesting things. It's the young person's job to be insulted by that. And as much as this is frustrating, it's the parent's job to wonder about that. Is this a phase, right? But as the young person, you can't fast forward your brain into how you'll feel when you're 30 and then retroactively figure out what to feel now. You are 13 or you are 15. And right now what you're feeling is all you know. It's real. It doesn't make it less real, even if one day you were to feel differently. You're still living your life right now as a 13-year-old or 15-year-old or 19-year-old. So it's very difficult for a young person to hear that phrase from their parents and not take it very personally. It feels like your parents are telling you, you don't really know who you are. And at the end of the day, the truth is that everybody everybody knows what they're experiencing on a personal level and the people who know us and love us have a different perspective on us and they're never going to be exactly the same you know your parents can't get inside your body and your brain and know what it feels like to be you but from the outside looking on, they might have some ideas about what you're going through. And it's kind of hard to hold both of those facts at the same time. But they're both kind of true. And I think, that, yeah, I think you're right. And I think, you know, the faith, just to even say it's a phase, it's it's. It's not even that the parent isn't allowed to say it's it's a phase. The parent isn't actually allowed to think it. And the parent can't help what they're thinking. <laughs> they're thinking things because they've been thinking nothing but you as a child for the last 15 years. So, you know, you're pretty much in their mind 
most of the time, a lot of the time. You're just there. It's just like there you are. And um, so it's, it's, it's extraordinary how much time my children occupy in my mind. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just walking around when I'm, you know, buttering bread or whatever I'm doing, I'm thinking of different var- variations of what it is to be probably too much now that I'm just discussing it here with you. I'm slightly cringing. But anyway, the point is our children take up our mind, uh, uh, our mind all the time. And so we are thinking it might be a phase. We're thinking everything. But I think par- children know, our, so they know their, their parents. And so they know you've thought this is just a phase. And I will do you for wrong think. <laughs> And the parents are like, yeah, well, guilty. But I've also thought a hundred things. I've also thought that it's not a face. I've also thought lots of different things. But it's so it's so unfortunate. There's a few things, you know, in the other episode we talked about with suicide, like a cri de cour, where, you know, it's a cry of, of, of help, a cry from the heart. And, and, and we we need it. And we need we discussed how it needs a new phrase because it, it almost denigrates what's going on the same with it's a phase because it's not a phase it's an intense experience that is part of your identity you you know what I mean while the parent is thinking you're going through a thing here you know you know that lovely uh that lovely song from Cat Stevens father and son do you not know it Oh, 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 I think I do. Is that the one where like he goes through different yeah. phases of the kids' life? Oh, yes, oh no, yes, that's yes. That, that's cats in the cradle. No, oh, fa- yeah, father okay. and son is uh, the father is speaking. He's saying, you know, take it handy, go slow, don't be in a hurry, and the yo- the child is answering. The son is answering. Get out of my way! I'm in a hurry. I'm in a hurry, and you don't understand the depths of my passion. And honestly, we mellow. So you know, when you're my age. I'm so much mellower. I can't live at the intensity of the teenager so I can remember it. But it's like you, the teenager, looking back at what you were when you were six. You, you look back on, oh, I remember that. And it's kind of like being in a different country. I remember when I was like that, but I'm not like it now. And honestly, you can't, you can, very few people aren't mellower at 45 than what they were at 15. Do you, do you know what I mean? So we've, we're have we from the mellow place looking at the intensity going, oh, come over this direction, mellow, it's much nicer. And the intense teenager's like, get out of my way, you superficial fool. Like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I'm sure there are many, many more pieces of, you know, communication breakdown that happen between young people and their parents when they're first questioning. But maybe now we can move to a scenario that sometimes happens a little bit down the line. You know, I, I've certainly met some young people who they're um, exploring of identity. Sometimes it's just um, something that happens for a short time and then they find other valuable things about their identity. But sometimes young people explore a different identity in more of a long-term way. So what happens, let's say, a few years in Stella, let's say um, a young person is in kind of a stalemate situation with their parents. Their parents at home act like nothing's happening when it comes to gender, but at school, let's say teachers are calling them a different name and their friends use a different name for them and people are using different pronouns for them at school. And yet at home, they're kind of living in their their home as though there's nothing going on with gender what do you think might be going on with communication there I know to give some insight into where the parents are at very often the parents feel like there's an elephant in the room that we can't discuss because it falls into fights so we might like that you know parents can say things like we haven't mentioned gender since in six months it hasn't come up and yet it's never been far from my mind and I don't think it's been far from the teenager's mind And the teenager, I think, is often thinking, why are you not just falling in with what everybody else is thinking? If you follow me, why are you being the awkward one? And the parent is thinking, well, I love you the most and I'm the one who's more scared than everybody else. You know, everybody else is a bit invested in you. I've invested my heart into you. And so I'm that bit more in. And so... I'm holding out, making sure that you have to be that little bit safer for me to nod along. 
And that is from a place of love, you know, but it's very, very hard because the communication, I think, turns into a really difficult, really difficult time at that point. What do you think is going on for the teenager at that point? I think the young person is thinking, you know, my parents are the last people on earth that can't get with the program. Everybody else it makes this a non-issue. Sometimes I hear people say, especially a few years in, you know, gender is not even that big of a deal to me, but they're, my parents are making it such a big deal. And and again, I think, you know, the parents are probably terrified of going down a medical path that maybe the child, maybe it will complicate their health. Maybe they will regret it. I mean, there are so many issues, but it's it's challenging, I think, for the young person because right now, you know, I, I'll just say, I often tell clients that I work with, I don't envy being dysphoric in the year 2021 because there's no good solid information about it. Most accounts that you can find online are made by other young gender dysphoric people talking about their transitions, but we don't actually have any long-term research that these interventions are necessarily super helpful. So I don't envy your position at all if you are a young dysphoric person listening to this. And because of that kind of context of this is just a weird time in the field of medicine around gender, it can be so confusing as to why mom and dad are kind of holding this position that nobody else seems to be holding except for them. And I I really would like, I'd like to try and help maybe parents understand why their position is seems so weird to their kid, but also why do parents hold that position when it seems like everybody else on the face of the planet Earth is like fine with it? Um, yeah, I think it depends on the parents because um, sometimes one parent is fine with it and the other parent isn't. I would go back to fear. I would go back to thinking it, it the level of fear shapes our, our, our action and our behavior. And if the parent is very, very frightened, they would be very, very reluctant to go forward. And if they aren't frightened, they, they, they will allow it unfold. I think maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe you could add more, but I, I think it's based on fear. Well, I think that it's partially based on fear, but I think there's another important thing going on amongst many. Parents look at their kid and they they see that their kid has become really invested in this idea of, you know, what they see as changing their identity. The young person might think, no, I'm becoming more myself. Yeah. But at least what the parent is seeing is like, let's say they have a natal female child, a daughter. They're saying, you know, you're giving up on yourself. You're giving up on being the girl that you've always been. And you want to become this new person and leave yourself behind, but we're not ready to give up on you. We believe in you still, and we think you can do it. And so I think, you know, maybe that comes from a place of fear, but it also might come from a place of kind of having belief in your kid that even though you're struggling, you don't have to throw away your life to become a new person. And I, I wonder if that feels like something that parents might be thinking. I, I think you're right. I think it's a really good point. I think a lot of parents will say, you think it's dead naming and you think it's awful to refer to that little kid who was six and eight and ten. But that's my greatest joy. Like I, I was madly in love with that kid and I, I, I just revel in those memories and I love those pictures on the wall and I chose your name and I agonized over this name. Do you know what I mean? It was major, major effort has gone into and I've kind of I revel in all of everything that has happened in your life. Even the bad stuff. I was there all along. And then now we're not allowed to talk about it. And it's 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 the most important part of my life has been has been just discarded here. 
And so they're they're feeling silenced, a lot of the parents. And like the child is saying, but it's painful for me. But yeah. the parent, yeah, go on. You tell me. What no, the I mean, to think about what the, the young person might be thinking, that's fine that you loved those moments, but you didn't see that inside I was struggling. Like those are good memories for you. And maybe I had moments of being happy, but also there were parts of me that were having a hard time. And, you know, for, for many young people, especially after a few years of questioning their gender, they, they recognize that, yeah, I didn't exactly have gender dysphoria back then, but I, I knew I felt different. Or maybe I was kind of jealous of guys, you know, who could play that way or be that way. Or I didn't like when they split up the genders at school and it felt weird. So, you know, parents are like, no, you were never gender dysphoric as a kid. And the kid's like, yeah, but I had these weird experiences with gender. So what do they mean? I mean, if this isn't who I am, what does this mean? Why is this happening to me? if that wasn't real. And I think sometimes a young person can feel like the parents are just dismissing all of the puzzle pieces that the kid's trying to put together. And sometimes the kid is earnestly saying, look, mom, if this doesn't mean I'm trans, then why am I having this experience? And sometimes the parents don't actually have a great answer for that. Sometimes they do. Maybe the kid doesn't really like the answer. But I think a lot of young people just kind of feel like, well, why is this happening to me then? Can you answer that, mom or dad? Yeah. And the the parent, I suppose, in many ways might be thinking they have their own insight into why it's happening and often they don't agree. So the the, the teenager's thinking one thing, the, the parent is thinking the other. And this is when it gets really interesting because honestly, the adolescent knows themselves. They're inside and they know who they are. But the parent has looked at this child. They've seen them learn how to ride a bike. They've seen them learn how to write to write and read and eat and all those things. So they've seen a different side. When you're an onlooker watching somebody, you have a different knowledge of the person than being the person. And I suppose I I I I really didn't think that my my parents knew me at all, but they they knew something of me. They knew the the person I presented. So even if this adolescent is thinking, well, you don't know me, I would say, well, they do know something because they've lived with you. So they know what you present, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, which is which is part of you, because even if you were an unhappy kid and you presented a mask of of happiness, W.B. Yeats has a great poem called The Mask. And he basically says, well, if you're wearing the mask, the mask is part of you. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think that same principle applies the other way around. You know, we all, as as somebody's child, we know our parents in a way that only the child of that family knows them. So, of course, we, we always know somebody that is an intimate part of our life from our perspective. And that's a valuable perspective, too. I mean, that's why family therapy, when it's done well, is so valuable, because sometimes we don't realize the way our parents see us or the way we see our children. And so it's, it's very, it's very important to remember that two contradictory things can be true at the same time. Like your parents don't really know you, but they also do. And your kids, your kids also know you in a way that you don't know yourself as a parent. (laughs) Unfortunately, I do want to bring up here um, because it feels exactly when it would be happening. There can be communication breakdown and there can be like, we cannot talk about it. And it could be helpful at this point for for parents to say, well, let's talk about how we how we can't talk about it. Let's talk about our silences. Let's talk about how wonder what we can talk about. Can we talk about politics? Can we can we find some places where we can just reconnect? And I think generally most people are upset if if there's a communication breakdown and if there's a kind of elephant in the room and we can't talk and nobody's happy with each other, it, if at all possible. I do think it's very important that if parents can say, well, what can we talk about? Because the parents feel overwhelmed and frightened and silenced and they feel their truth is being kind of dismissed. And they feel I I might have a wrong view of you, but I do have a long view of you. 
And it's, it's certainly not from lack of effort. And to be dismissed summarily is incredibly uh, deflating. Yeah. And along a similar vein, you know, sometimes when I work with parents, I tell them, you know, try, try and sit down and think over the last, you know, several months or several years in your relationships with your child and think about how they might be feeling and then do an honest evaluation of what could have been different from your end and maybe share that with your child. So that might sound something like, you know, honey, I've been thinking a lot about how hard it's been for us to discuss these issues. And obviously we are coming at this from different angles. And I, I know that it's uncomfortable to talk about these things sometimes, but I want to do a better job of listening, let's say. But I also want you to be patient with me because I'm your parent and my job is to think about your well-being. So sometimes we are going to approach these things from different angles. But I, I want us to keep talking about this because I care about you and I, I see that this is an important part of your life. So this whole, you know, shutting it off and just making it a non-issue, I think it's not, it's not always sustainable and it makes a big rift exist between a young person and their parents. And um, we can talk about this as we get into the third scenario, but I, I just generally think parents sometimes feel like their kids trying to pull away from them and doesn't actually want to be close with them. But almost always a young person feels really, really desperate to have their parents' love and approval. And so I think that trying to repair that breakdown of communication serves everybody in the relationship and everybody in the family. Yeah. I think the parents feel everything I say is wrong. So I, I need to just say nothing. And then there's a standoff happens. And so it becomes quite transactional sometimes for the parents. They feel all I'm doing is providing lifts and money and uh, I'm being used and abused I remember one parent saying to me, like, this is this is abuse. I wouldn't take this from anybody except, <laughs> <laughs> do you know, yeah. which, is, which is. And there is a kind of a, a demoralizing feeling of I'm old and useless to my my teenager who just doesn't even want to hear what I've got to say and rolls their eyes at everything I say. And that you do feel very vulnerable. You're trying to be the strong parent who's leading the way and is the leader, while you're, you know, the people you're apparently leading are just literally looking at the back of their brains as they're rolling their eyes so high. <laughs> 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 it's, it's so it's so vulnerable making and the parent when you're feeling vulnerable and you're a parent or a leader of anything, or an ostensible leader, very often you go into well high handed. And this is what mm, you're going to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so for all the kind of high handed, these are the rules, young lady, th that can be a, a, literally because I've lost so much kind of ground here and I'm trying to have some sense of control. I do sometimes think it's it's helpful when I talk with kids and I say, what would you do as a parent if you were your parent? That can be quite kind of reflective. For, yeah. for it and they're like that's well, very not. interesting yeah <laughs> they generally say well not what she's doing right <laughs> right then, then, but let's move into what would you do what would you actually do and it yeah. can be helpful yeah for sure I mean another way to think about it is well to, to kind of take the parents perspective is if you're a young person a teenager imagine imagine that there's a person at your school or a person that you know who you just think is the absolute most amazing person oh, yeah. and yeah. all you want is to be <laughs> friends with them. And you make a comment and they roll their eyes yeah. and like exactly. make That's that. It. I mean, that would be heartbreaking. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that is to say when we, when we are talking with our parents, it's, it's important to remember, even if they say things that are annoying, they love us and they want the best. And so it's important to kind of be mindful of the way we speak to one another. And of course, that's the same for parents. You talked about how coming from a place of fear can, you know, cause a parent to maybe say something and then regret it. And that's a normal part of being in a family. I mean, I think the thing is that when you love somebody, that means that they have the potential to hurt your feelings. 
That's part of being in any kind of important relationship. So you got to be patient with one another because sometimes we say things that hurt our loved one's feelings and sometimes they hurt our feelings. Uh, You're so right. And what very often happens with this context of gender and, and, you know, a a rift on some level, generally it will be that there's a, a, a difference in interpretation of what should happen. And so there's literally, this is just down to it, you know, the vanity of small differences one could say, but certainly one could say, we have two different opinions here. The child is thinking one thing and sometimes not both parents, but one of the parents is thinking the other. And so one parent might have this running theory that the child is gay or lesbian or bi, or they might have another theory, another parent might have another theory of this is all autism related. And so the parent keeps on circling back to their point because they honestly, it's not that they're trying to be antagonistic. It is their deduction. That is their kind of, their genuine, I've assessed it. I've thought about it more than I've ever thought about anything in my life before. This is my genuine It's nothing to do with bigotry and everything to do with my knowledge of my kid. And the kid has a different sense, different interpretation. And that's hard to kind of, when you get a deep difference of opinion in in a family household, you really, you really have to work at it to remember the love, you know. That's right. That's right. What happens, let's say we're moving this conversation forward a couple more years. Let's say there's a person who's maybe now a young adult and maybe they've been living in their gender identity for years now. Maybe they're medicalizing or maybe they're starting to transition medically. What, what is this like for parents? I think when the parent, when the child has moved away, maybe they're in college or they're away and the parent is distressed because, you know, the, the child has gone a different direction to where the parent thought. And the parent can feel a real kind of sense of of distance from the kid. At a time when they're actually they're trying to renegotiate the relationship anyway, I think a lot of parents feel out of control and they feel they got it wrong. On some level, they got their parenting wrong. It mightn't be because the child is transitioned, but because there is now a distance between the parent and the child, they feel it's gone wrong. We're not close. We were so close. So many parents say to me, we were so close. We were so, so close. And now we're not. And it's it's devastating. It's truly mm-hmm. devastating mm-hmm. to feel that. And mm-hmm. I think the parents feel they are at fault, they have done wrong, and they don't know how to negotiate back because you can't come to, to a child or you can't come to anybody you love fake and pretend mm-hmm. that you, you're, you're happy with X or Y. It's, that's a fake relationship which doesn't really do anything for anybody. And so you're in a bind then because there's a lovely line from, you know, the poet Rumi, you know, beyond wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field, I'll meet you there. And I think that's where we've got to go. I really do think that's where we've got to go with this, that we've got to go beyond what you're thinking and I'm thinking and just let's meet in the place of love where, you know, you used to sit in my lap and we used to kind of cuddle each other and laugh or whatever. We used to do this or we used to let's rekindle that because it goes so deep that that, you know, that mother child or father child, it's such a deep connection. It's unlike other relationships, so it's worth it. So the courts, it's really interesting that the courts appreciate that no matter how difficult the parent-child bond is, it does better. We all do better if we can keep it going. And so when parents and, and, and maybe adult children are certainly becoming adult children are feeling like there's a rift and we're, we're cold, you'll probably do better if you can on some level meet each other. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And just to kind of take the, I'm going to switch this up a little and take the parents' perspective for a minute. I think one of the things that comes to mind, I think, for some parents, especially if their children are starting a medical pathway, is that all the concerns that the parent initially had are still there. And now the young person is starting to experiment with medications 
and medical treatments that are going to make changes in this young person's body that are irreversible. And so the parent might be hoping, you know, like, oh my goodness, I hope, I hope that what my kid is doing is the right thing for them, but I'm really, really scared that they're now kind of opening a can of worms, medically speaking, that that they think is going to help, but in the long run may not actually help them. And that is a really hard place to be because before, maybe it was just like that stalemate place that we talked about where, you know, we're kind of stuck, we're not able to talk about this, but no harm done because my kid is is still medically in a safe place. But once the young person starts a medical process, it just, the stakes get a lot higher. And, you know, I think that's a hard place to be because part of growing up also means, you know, we all have gone through this. We like leave the care of our parents and we start making decisions for ourselves. And sometimes our parents don't like our decisions. And, you know, you can't, turn back the clock and become a baby again where your parents get to make decisions for you but on the other hand you know parents never stop worrying about their kids no matter what and so if a young person is starting to make these permanent medical changes to their body then the parent is kind of in this position where it's a lot harder to just make this the elephant in the room because there are visible changes. I see my kid changing and I'm really scared that this is not actually going to help them. I know. And you know, when the, 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 the teenager or the adolescent or the young adult is changing, when they've taken the medication, they can be in a place of euphoria. They can feel like, why are you raining on this parade? Like, God, this is the thing I've wanted. Can you not see that this is what I want? And why are you rejecting this part of me and insisting on clinging on to the old part of me that I want to get rid of? Because it feels like, I think for the young person who's medicating, it feels like their parents are just literally denying their pain and, and want to cling on to the old painful identity rather than celebrate the new identity. And so while the adolescent is thinking, oh, look, my voice is changing. I'm become, it's becoming deeper because of the testosterone, for example. Isn't this amazing? I'm actually becoming the person I want to be. While the parent is going, oh my God, their voice, their voice is changing. Mm -hmm. I do think, by the way, I do think psychologically when somebody's voice, like I, I could meet somebody from school like, you know, you can you can really go back a long way and their voice is what I remember, if you follow me. So it, it is psychologically a big thing. While the, the, while, the, while the young person is reveling in this, my voice is changing. Anybody around them is thinking, wow, that really changes you. Yes, it ch changes you a lot. It changes you a lot. And it's the same with the body, like if, if, it's, if it's a male transition and male MTF, like going to female and the, the male is getting breasts. Again, the hug feels different for the parent and, the, you know, the, the kid is thinking this is fabulous. Why, 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 why are you clinging to the wreck here? Come with me to the new transition. Come with me to the new identity. It's such a tug of war at this point, it isn't is. it? It is. It really is. <sighs> what advice do we have for maybe this, the parent in this last scenario or the young person in this last scenario? I kind of, my, my feeling is all you can do when there's a, an extreme change of, what's for not extreme change, an extreme difference of opinion in how to live your lives. I think you've got to get to a place where you've got to separate further so that you can come back I think you've got to separate further, that there has to be some sort of pulling away to be able to come back. I do think there has to be room for the parents to be uncomfortable with the voice changing. I do th the body changing. It's so hard to explain how intimate, like when I see my kids, my hand just goes out and I want to touch them. It's so reflexive. I just touch their cheek. I just, 
I, mm. I, I see them and I touch because I'm the mother. They are the kid who is one day going, get off me. Like, God, yeah. what's with all the hands here? <laughs> Thankfully, they're not <laughs> yes. yet at that. And they still revel in it. But they're going to come kind of like, just stop, stop. And so the the I do think that it's it's much, much harder for the parent than it is for other people. So like to have some kind of compassion for the parent who is who is in that place, because it's really, really hard. But I do think the parent needs to say, you've got to pull away so we can come back. What do you think? Because I know I'm kind of saying something slightly dangerous there, but it's it's the only thing I can think of when I, I meet parents and I meet youth. I just think there needs to be an individuation process. There needs to be a separation so you can meet again as adults. Yeah, I, th- I think that's right. I mean, individuation in your late teens and early 20s is a very important part of learning how to stand on your own two feet. And that doesn't necessarily mean you cut contact. You know, I think what it means is that um, parents need to refocus their energies and their attentions on developing, you know, their own lives too, especially after a young person has moved out of the house, they're now off at college. The nature of your relationship is supposed to change a bit. So the way you are involved with your 19 or 20 year old is not supposed to be the same as when they were 15. You know, have your parenting strategies been scaffolding them towards that independence? Or are you still treating that relationship as you did when they were younger? So, you know, that's the time in life where you give them advice on the apartment search, how that's going. You may be Um, offer them your wisdom as a person who's maybe been in the workforce for some time as they apply for jobs or as they get through, you know, uh, part-time work. So the nature of the way you support your young adult child has to be different. And parents, I mean, empty nest is a real thing. It's, It's probably heartbreaking. I'm not a parent, but I can only imagine how hard it is when you've been needed all this time and then all of a sudden you're on your own. So parents do need to nurture their own interests and their own hobbies and kind of create a different type of relationship with their adult child. And the advice that I would give to young people, the young adults in this position, I think there's two things that really come to my mind. So one, you have to accept the fact that your parents have their own relationship with you and own understanding of you and to expect them to just get on board just because you've started a medical process, it really doesn't honor their experience as parents. And the truth is you, you can't really know what that's like for them. And so I think you have to, like Stella said, hold some space for the fact that they're going to have their own experience of what this means to them. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. I do think that there's a, a, a real difficulty when the parent is kind of thinking, you've gone away in a that I, I can't abide. I, I, I can't really be. It's almost like when somebody has a different religion. It's, it's like I, ca- I can't connect with you here. And so the parent finds it very, very difficult. And I think there has to be room for the parent to find it difficult. You will renegotiate. There will be a renegotiation, but there can be a period of of coldness and it's not necessarily the end. And I know when you're in the middle of it, you're like, this is the most frightening thing ever, but it kind of has to sometimes happen. I do think, though, one thing that is it just it, it, it comes up for me a few times. I remember when I, I, I got my first flat and my first job and stuff and the kind of slight feeling of my parents looking down on my independence because they were like look at the state of that flat and geez is this this is a fire hazard what is this a (laughs) flat is an apartment by the way for our American listeners (laughs) sorry (laughs) they're like did she get a flat white coffee why are they so upset that she got a flat white coffee (laughs) but I remember I think yeah yeah. my mom or dad they were convinced it was a fire hazard and I thought if they say one more time it's a fire hazard I'm going to go mad because this is my this is my independence. This is I'm really proud of this. Yes, yes. And the parents are really quite dismissive of it because, like, why would you live in this hovel when you could live at home with us? And I'm like, well, <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> kidding. You know, yeah. 
And, yeah. and so the parents can almost try and lure the kids home because they're like, you can't live in this squalor or you can't live in this scene. And yeah, uh, why it mightn't be that that's going on now. What can be often the case is the kid is in the the other room cold or the kid is away from them. But it's it's not that it's 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 squalor that I lived in. It's more the values the kid is living in is very different to the parents' values. But it's the same. I see it as the same analogy. It's like, no, I'm doing my own thing. <laughs> Leave yes. me be. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's what the kid is thinking. Just back off and stop judging it as if yours is better. Because honestly, I'm just in the middle of something. And I'm just leave me be and let me do it and stop judging it. And the parent is there judging away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, what comes to mind is like parents. Well, this is understandable. And I think there's probably a biological reason that parents have very kind of narrow expectations for what success looks like in their children. But parents often think about success in life is going to look like this path. And if the kid deviates at all, they get really scared that they're going to ruin their life. And the young person is like, look, I have my own priorities and my own value systems. And I think there's a level of trust that parents need to express in their young adult child that like, look, you know, I don't quite understand the path you're on, but I believe in you as a person that you're going to figure it out. Even if you take some weird detours, even if you change your mind about this or that aspect of life, whether it's the major you've picked or even parts of transition. I mean, we don't know. None of us has a crystal ball. So I think offering a little bit of belief in your kid that even if they're taking a path you don't quite agree with, that they have the power in their character, in their abilities to sort through it. And I guess the the second piece of advice that I'd give to the young adult in this scenario, this is a really tricky one, and this comes up a lot in therapy. If you've been in a situation where you're excited about transition and your parents are not excited about transition, sometimes what happens is all of the potential doubts that you might have had live with your parents. They've completely taken the role of being skeptical, worrying about the medical part, worrying if this is temporary, and you have maybe yeah. been forced to constantly defend your identity, as we should, I and mean, we should defend our identities. But I would caution you, if you do find yourself getting some space from mom and dad, use that as an opportunity to really slow down and think, okay, for myself, not because of what mom says or what dad says, for myself, are there things about transition that I feel I need to explore before I feel comfortable with doing this? Because it is a big deal. Yeah, because the problem is when positions are taken, the, you know, the, the I remember, I know when you've got a position to defend and I do it to this day, you give me a position to defend and I'll defend it so well that I haven't taken a breath to say, well, what do I, what do I actually think? I know I took yeah. this position three years ago and oh, by God, I know I'm good at defending it, but can <laughs> I just check and see yeah. well, what, what, are, what are my views? <laughs> May I just check in with it? Yeah. Because you're yeah. so tightly holding your position, especially when you feel it's been denigrated. When you feel your position hasn't been taken seriously, you become so defensive over your position that you, you're not honouring the kind of space of reflection. And, you know, let's just look at this in a non-defensive way. Very, very, very hard to be non-defensive when you've made to be defensive. Yes, definitely. And it's very, very hard equally to, to, to go into the parents' shoes for a moment. It's very, very hard to watch somebody you love make it a mistake, what you perceive as a mistake, and to sit by and not respond in major energy. It's very hard to kind of go, I let you make your mistake and I think it will harm you and that's your freedom and I love you with all my heart and I think it's very hard to hold that space. It's almost impossible. And so what happens is it might come out in anger, it might come out in tears, it might come out in relentless texts, it might come out in lots of different ways. (laughs) 
But, you know, they're both very equal position. One thing I would really like to say now we're coming towards the end is, do you know, gender dysphoria, gender distress, as you said, in 2021 is really, really hard. It's hard for everybody. And so we've got to be compassionate to ourselves if we have it, to the parents if they're living with it, to the siblings if they're living with it. It's really hard on everybody. It's a, it's a difficult, baffling, cunning and, you know, devastating condition for somebody. And so we've really got to learn some compassion for everybody in it. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. This podcast is partially sponsored by RIME, Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics. RIME is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. If you found value in our show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Just go to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash wider lens pod. Our discussions are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services. 